Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Popetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. It's a great pleasure to be speaking today on our next podcast with Dr. Sharon Hayes, who's a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Welcome, Sharon. It's great to be here with you. And Sharon, you have done such a great job leading the team, starting the team, and, and really helping us all to define and understand SCAD. Can you tell us uh, briefly just how that came about? Well, we're talking about spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And Steve, you and I are pretty close in um, our training time. And if you recall, what we learned about SCAD is we'd probably see one or two cases in our lifetime, in our career, that it pretty much only happened to pregnant women or early postpartum, and that it was almost universally fatal. So that was really the state of, uh, of, of the knowledge of SCAD uh, as we knew it until you know, we started learning more about heart disease in women and that maybe it was, we were seeing it a little bit more, but I was actually, um, for this research that we took, and I was actually approached by some patients who had found each other on an online uh, community sponsored by Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease. And they had found each other and decided that, you know what, SCAD can't be that rare because there's 70 of us and um, sort of threw down the gauntlet at a, at a Women Heart meeting that we host here at Mayo um, back in 2009. I think the challenge initially was, wow, um, 70 women. I went back and did a lit search after this, and um, there, the largest case series was 43 people. So I thought maybe it isn't quite as rare, but figuring out how to leverage an online community who only had screen names, no emails, no nothing, into a research enterprise um, is kind of a bigger story, but I, I always describe this as patient-initiated research because it wasn't investigator-initiated. Um, uh, it was certainly patient-inspired. And uh, to this day, we depend a great deal on the volunteers and the folks who help support um, primarily women with SCAD, but men with SCAD too. That's terrific. And you're, you're being very humble, but you've done a great job with it. Can you just briefly tell us what SCAD is? How have you defined it? So spontaneous coronary artery dissection is um, a dissection, so a split in the, uh, in the layers of the coronary arteries that is atraumatic, so it's not due to chest trauma. It is not due to procedures, so not iatrogenic, so truly spontaneous. And it's not due to atherosclerosis, so it's not a plaque rupture with a dissection. Um, I say that definition, and that has really been the accepted definition for the past eight to 10 years, because if you look at the older literature, often those reports included non-spontaneous. They included atherosclerotic dissections. They included, and, and as a result, if you do look back at the literature, there's a lot more men um, whether it was they were not doing angiograms on women, you know, the under diagnosis or whether there was just a mix. So I do think that the literature we're seeing and can depend upon really is much more this pure or subset of individuals who largely um, don't have atherosclerosis. Some of the older folks do um, in our series, but the dissection itself is not due to a plaque. So why is it so important to differentiate this SCAD from other types of acute coronary syndrome? Well, I, I think we can think about one, we as cardiologists and we as physicians, we want to make the right diagnosis anyway, but the stakes are reasonably high, both acutely and um, longitudinally after, because the treatment is different from the outset. So one of the things that we observed uh, here at Mayo um, uh, in some of our early reports, but was also reported out uh, from Vancouver in Italy, so is that if we look at all comers with ACS who get PCI, the success rate's like 92, 95%, right? They, they, but if you look at the subset of SCAD, it was about 66%, 60, 60 to 65%. So a big gap in primary PCI. And the reasons for that were they couldn't cross the lesion, right? There was a dissection flap and the wire couldn't get down. Or more commonly, there was extension of 
the dissection, the intramural hematoma, often with truly catastrophic um, uh, uh, effects uh, with left main dissections or a full metal jacket. So that pattern recognition in the cath lab when you have a patient with a myocardial infarction is critical. And, and so that's where it starts because we also know that SCAD, unlike an atherosclerotic plaque rupture, is likely to heal on its own. So it is a dissection, and just like dissections that were um, induced by procedural factors. So there are a lot of reasons to recognize SCAD so that we can manage the SCAD, that dissection, more conservatively unless we're pushed to because of patient factors like ongoing chest pain or, uh, or hemodynamic instability. So that's the first reason. Acutely, it's important because right off the bat, our treatment would, should be different. I think the other factor is these are individuals who largely do not have substantial cardiovascular risk factors. Most are not hy hyperlipidemic. Um, and so we don't, and there's no reason to believe that uh, putting everybody who had a SCAD on a statin needs to, you know, would help with secondary prevention. So important to make that initial diagnosis because it has implications for medical treatment. It has implications for associated conditions. You know, if we've got somebody with atherosclerosis, we're going to look for plaque elsewhere. We're going to make sure that, you know, all of their risk factors for cardiovascular progression and secondary prevention are addressed. Whereas with SCAD, we know that about 70 to 80% of those individuals have a systemic arteriopathy. So they have aneurysms or dissections or fibromuscular dysplasia, which can result in risk for dissections and aneurysms that need to be followed. So that would be another reason to make that diagnosis because again, there's a branch port point for what we are concerned about um, after the diagnosis. Very good. So what is your follow-up of these patients then? So um, we start with uh, is in the hospital where the treatment is a bit different um, in that we, we don't use anticoagulation. Once we make that diagnosis, there is a theoretical um, risk because if you've got an intramural hematoma, theoretically that could bleed more and cause more obstruction or extend the, the, um, the uh, the dissection. And these lesions are not characterized by a lot of thrombus. So that would be an early thing. Uh, we generally uh, advise beta blocker therapy if they can tolerate by, uh, and support it with uh, blood pressure. Um, there is one observational study that would suggest that beta blocker therapy may reduce the risk of, um, of uh, recurrence. Um, even if that doesn't pan out, I think it's a, it's a reasonable option early on. The other difference is, you know, most of these folks go out of the hospital on aspirin and a lot go out on dual antiplatelet therapy, but there's really no evidence that that would benefit them. And so um, I have over the past few years even um, been thinking this is not a lifelong, lifelong aspirin situation. It might be, you know, the first six months or a year. And I personally don't prescribe um, dual antiplatelet therapy after they leave the hospital, unless they had evidence of thrombus. Um, others say 30 days or six months, but this isn't a, a, an instance where we would likely need to be on for a year if they don't get percutaneous intervention. Um, I think I'm sensitized to that because I think we're so used to using dual antiplatelet therapy after infarct. It's in the guidelines, but you have a large proportion of these individuals who are premenopausal, they are menstruating, and you put them on dual antiplatelet therapy, and some of them have such awful periods that they become anemic. And so the harm differential, and we know that women bleed more and bruise more anyway with, with that. So that's another aspect. Um, I think that it's really important in the follow-up that they get involved in cardiac rehabilitation. Now, I know you would agree with that entirely for any person with an infarct, but it is remarkably, it has been remarkable how many of these individuals have been told, oh, you were physically active before, oh, you were a runner, just go home and, you know, like heal yourself. Um, I think that's a, a big factor because the burden of depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and even PTSD in these patients is very high. And that's where cardiac rehab in the supportive environment can be uh, really important. 
Uh, most of the folks have normal blood pressure, but about 20, 25 percent are going to have elevated blood pressure or even hypertension. And so I think because most of the folks have uh, systemic arteriopathy, aiming for normal blood pressure, not just treating hypertension, but um, you know, really aiming for whether it's with beta blocker or a little diuretic or an ARB, um, uh, that um, good attention to uh, blood pressure control over a lifetime. I do a lot of counseling because a lot of them have normal blood pressure now, but I know that in 10 or 15 years, and I don't want them just being treated to 140. Um, we offer, although um, most patients with SCAD do not um, have a genetic basis, meaning they don't have necessarily a family history of SCAD or dissections, uh, at least considering and asking the questions that might lead to a diagnosis of some systemic connective tissue disease or family history. So a medical genetics uh, consultation is also reasonable. And then not time sensitive, doesn't have to be done as an inpatient, but because of that high prevalence of systemic arteriopathy, we follow the same guidelines that have been put forth by the FMD folks and their um, clinical recommendations. So a one-time imaging of arteries from brain to pelvis. Now, our practice is to do head and neck CTA, abdominal and pelvic CTA in a one setting, arms up, arms down, two injections. So we've got a nice protocol. And you say, well, that skips the chest. I will tell you the vast majority of these folks have had chest imaging to rule out PE or when they came in. Um, the other is to, when we looked at our data and those that we included the chest, um, chest imaging did not add anything um, in these patients. We had one Marfans, but it was a known Marfans. So we feel comfortable with that. Well, that's, that's a fascinating a story and fascinating disease. So you mentioned the pharmacotherapy do's and don'ts. What about statins? Uh, we don't give them routinely, but what if their lipids are hot? Yeah, so um, I use the, the the primary prevention guidelines for these folks. So um, so if they would warrant um, treatment for hyperlipidemia based on age and risk factor assessment, then uh, treat them. But I would be treating them, and I talk to them about this. I'm treating your future risk of atherosclerosis. I'm not. I have no reason to believe that putting you on a statin would actually reduce your risk of having another SCAD. Um, that is a challenge. Uh, we actually do not have any secondary prevention agents that have been proven um, to reduce uh, recurrent SCAD. Um, we now know from multiple series, and we've all used sort of different uh, statistics, but on average, what I will say to patients is there's probably about a 2 to 3% chance of recurrent SCAD per year because some have said about a 10% over five years or, you know, or whatever. Um, obviously, we would love to be able to better risk stratify. I mean, that's what we tell everyone. There's probably some people, because it was a per perfect storm, have virtually a zero risk of having a recurrent SCAD, and we have some who have had a, a number of them. Um, the other thing we advise is uh, avoiding exogenous hormone, um, whether it's oral contraceptives or, or uh, postmenopausal hormone therapy, and avoiding pregnancy. Uh, which is a whole conversation in and of itself, which is a bit easier when you're talking to a 45-year-old woman who has completed her family, but you can imagine the type of conversation and how uh, devastating it could be to that 22-year-old uh, who doesn't even have a boyfriend and talking about future um, reproductive, because we do know that pregnancy is a period of time of increased risk of SCAD and also pregnancy-related dissections tend to be more proximal, so have larger infarcts and more likely to result in heart failure. Very good. What about family members, uh, you know, sisters, daughters? So that is such a common question. You can imagine if you're um, a 45-year-old woman and you've just had a SCAD and you've got a, a daughter who just got married and is t thinking about having their first baby, you know, they're, they're, so, but currently, what we do offer is the medical genetics um, uh, consultation who often offer the, the sort of airtopathy panel. 
less than 4 or 5% of those have some mutation there. But honestly, there's no role for um, imaging screening of these individuals, of family members. There is no role for genetic screening um, unless the, the index patient has a mutation. Um, because if you think about it, although fibromuscular dysplasia, for instance, is uncommon, but probably it affects about 1% of women, I mean, maybe more. And we don't have 1% of young women having spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So the approach to, um, to family screening is to ask about a family history, but not to do any additional diagnostic testing with family members. Okay. Well, you've given us a great overview. Uh, it, it really culminates many years of your experience and expertise, and we appreciate it. So the, the bottom line is, uh, think of it. Don't intervene on it if you find it. Please get them to rehab. Please give normal pharmacologic therapy as whatever is indicated for their other diseases. And then lifestyle. Does lifestyle play a role? Marathon runners, can they continue to run? What, what do you tell them? So um, we know that it, we use an abundance of caution, and that's actually how I counsel patients because um, a certain, probably less than 25%, but um, a, a proportion of SCADs um, are related to perhaps a, a trigger of either extreme emotional stress, and these are really heartbreaking stressors, or, um, or extreme physical stress. And many of the folks who have SCAD are physically active, some extremely physically active. And because of the sheer stress, because of the jump in blood pressure, what we advise patients is they um, avoid uh, vigorous competitive exercise and competing. Um, so uh, exercising to exhaustion. So I give examples of, you know, you don't go to boot camps where the sole purpose is to have you leave the session unable to, to walk. You know, if you ask from a practical standpoint, can I run a marathon again? I actually say I advise against it because that is a really endurance training. Can I run a 10K? Yeah, run a 10K, but this is not the time to go for personal best and to race a 10K. So we look at, yes, 30 to 40 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every day, just like everyone else, including some uh, interval training, but not the high intensity, not exercising in extremes of temperature. From a lifting standpoint, we advise we don't give a definite, unless we've tested them, uh, we don't give a weight, an arbitrary weight limit. I've seen that done, you know, and you can't tell a woman don't lift more than 10 pounds when she just had a baby and that baby will be more than 10 pounds at eight weeks. But we do advise that individuals do not lift items, whether it's in the gym, at home, or in the yard that require them to strain or valsalva. And for most women, that's going to be somewhere between 20 and 50 pounds. I give them an example about what, you know, what you, you know, maybe lift something and breathe through it. Uh, so, so we try to get them to live their life as if they will never have another SCAD, but be prepared um, if they have symptoms again. Okay. Well, that's a great, uh, a great summary. Uh, you touched all the different, all the points, the diagnosis, the treatment long-term follow-up, the family, the pharmacology, and the psyche, most importantly, for these poor women that have SCAD. So Dr. Sharon Hayes, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you, and thank you for educating us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.